Hi, it's IFL3 here, and this video we're just going to go over the welder that I done in the last video and give you a bit more of an explanation of why and how I done it. So why would I want to take an old transformer stick welder, arc welder, buzz box, put it in a new case, because it's kind of like older technology. Sometimes the older technology uh, is more robust, like if I was to leave this outside, there isn't as many transistors and all that sort of stuff in it to go wrong. If I was to drop it, you know, uh, bang it around, it's robust, it's a robust unit, it's not a lot to go wrong on it really, it's just hardcore. They are inefficient if you were to use them long time or long term in like a workshop, but I don't use that, I'm not a professional welder. Efficiency isn't really bothering me as much. I just want something that's reliable. That doesn't need too much care, that doesn't mind being out in the shed. If it gets a bit wet, it gets a bit wet. Why I didn't want the gasless MIG anymore was because it was an old Maypole one, had two power settings, which also controlled the wire speed feed. That then made it a pain to weld, you know, really thin stuff. Really thick stuff was getting, was okay, you know, but the uh, the whole tubing could have done with replacing. It started getting a bit old. Just having those two power settings really wasn't ideal, but to get a bit more proficient using sticks. So this is it. So I'd made, made the decision to chop it, plus I was running out of space. And also other things, I didn't kind of trust the handle picking up. The, this thing weighs quite a lot. This, 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 I don't know. I don't know my head how much it weighs, but it's got some weight in it. So when carrying it, I wanted to make sure I, it, was, it was secure and wasn't gonna fail on me and then rip down the side of my leg. I think it was a bit of a health and safety issue. Now, when I started taking it apart, the first thing, I kind of start that was going wrong was um, amp or current knob on the front here has a little allen key in there and that was all gunked in there I just had to put some of that um, weasel piss uh, which is like um, half transmission half acetone solution into there to leave that to soak in I had to heat it I kind of scorched it up a little bit around here where I was heating it with the gun but I finally managed to get it up get it off sort of thing so it's, it's kind of like one of those products where you start and it could have all have been kind of sort of over by that little thing there I was up in an iron about chopping it off and then maybe welding like a little socket in so in inside uh, down here and here there's um two really high powerful springs in there really like be careful as i was pushing them out because you could feel the tension in them and they were ready to pop and ping put on some eye, i think i put on some eye protection on that one and then getting them in was a bit of a pain i had to use a screwdriver and almost push it in and down just to get it caught underneath the lip but they're sitting there now in fact this one isn't under pressure and i think that's because there's a washer that's due that needs to go in there as well but i didn't manage to get that washer in there quite interesting how the inside of these transformers are there isn't really a lot to them but this I, I like I like I like the old stuff, you know. It's got that rugged, robust, industrial kind of feel to it. So that's another reason why I really wanted to keep this transformer as well. So this black stuff here that I put on, it's like a latex. It goes onto rust directly. It's called verbatim. You basically remove the rust with a wire brush, get rid of the majority of it, and it's in a like a latex solution. And what it does is just converts the rust. A few people that I found on forums kind of recommended it. One guy on a transformer forum, I think it was an audio forum, said he uses it and it, it brings out this nice black color. And then obviously on top of that, put the, the yacht varnish over the top of it. And that, that, was, that was just to protect that surface. And uh, apparently a lot of transformers are actually varnished as well. And that stops the rust. Rust isn't actually too bad on the transformer from what I found. That doesn't matter. It helps to kind of insulate the transformer. There's, there's a couple of laminates on the side of, of here that will start to peel away and get loose. And I think that was that was to do the, possibly to do with the buzzing of it. It doesn't really buzz anymore. In fact, I had to put a bit of solder between the two connections just to see if it was actually on and there was a circuit or current going through it and there was it gave a nice big spark where i'd turn it on normally and you could hear a hum like a hmm when i had this one on i couldn't really hear a hum so i'm not too sure whether that's because of the uh now it's got the varnish in there and everything you can weld when they, from the factory they, they actually weld these but they say that when you start welding them in between each laminates you lose a bit of the flow or the actual proper terminology the magnetic flux or whatever so the paint stripper i used was from screwfix and it was brilliant on the actual original transformer casing 
maybe it was powder coated back in the day, but back in the day they probably didn't have the powder coating technology that they do have now. On this powder coated one on the old flux welder, it really was a lot harder to come off. I had to go over it probably about three times, four times. I was experimenting with different ways of, of doing it. Like if you put heat back on it, to try and melt it off, you actually kind of like re-bake the powder coating and so that, it, that makes it then harder to take off. I kind of think what it does is it gets underneath the layers in, into the paint, makes a bit of a gooey mess and softens it up. I wanted to strip this back to um, bare metal on this one. I was originally thinking about just sanding it down, keying it in like I did with the the tool cabinet, but I decided not to. I wanted to take this back to around to bare metal because there's a few places on the bottom that had to really start to rust. Uh, I just wanted to go over it and actually give that verbatim. Really want to advise putting it on anything that's not severely rusted. Doesn't give a good finish because you've got the latex, obviously, you can't really sand it down to key it in before you put paint over the top of it. And this is Hammerite that's been painted on. Now, spraying it would have been perfect, but I, I couldn't justify getting out the sprayer and cleaning it and making, you know, just for this little bit here. With the setup I'm in at the moment, it means getting it out of the shed, framing off an area, doing it. So I thought I'll, I'll, I'll paint it on. You know, it's in, if, depending on how the the actual under under verb 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 what's it called the verb verb verbatim verbatatan tin thing goes on. You know, I might if I have to strip this another time. It's not a problem. It's not powder coat. It's just hammer right. So the design layout when I was doing the transformer. I made it all central and put it on the central base plate, lined it all up and I thought, hang on a minute. When I went to go and put it in, it the, the, the centre bit here is slightly over to one side. It's not exactly 100% dead splat, smack bang in the middle. My calculations to start off with were perfect and then I kind of placed it on by fitment and fit, fitted it, thinking that it was going to be symmetrical. So I started changing around with it and then I realised by the time I was drilled some holes and done some more cutouts, that it was actually over on this side a little bit more. Originally, I did think this would be quite a nice little place to hold your rods in under there. You should put your rod, welding rods in there and everything. Um, but I think that it's kind of maybe a little bit too short and would you really want them on top of there with a chance of it falling down? So I cut out that little bit there. Obviously I needed these two side bits because that's what helps give it the frame, the rigidity. Um, but it is quite rigid, rigid, rigid. once it's all screwed, um, screwed in with the self tappers. It's actually quite solid in there. I put on some little feet on the bottom here just to bring it off the ground because that's like one of the original design floors there's on the little um, indentations down there was his feet which is a good idea because it's sitting close to water, it's sitting on wet ground or whatever so I put these little rubber feet on there. And some other design things was the uh, the actual the gauge I was thinking about putting a gauge back out in here with a little cut out on the window. It's not completely accurate, you, you, you don't dial it, you, this is just to get you in the ballpark and then from there, depending on the temperature, depending on your metal, then you, you'll adjust your amperage by a little bit here there and a little bit there sort of thing. So I used a nibbler for the nibbler, nibbler, a brilliant bit of kit, I wish I kind of would have bought one of these before many years ago. Attached it to the drill and I used that for cutting out the disc hole there. It's either that or a jigsaw. I wanted to use the nibbler to see how that goes and I quite like it. The, the filings that come out are just kind of like little moon crescents that it comes out. It's like a, a, a plunger with a cutter in it. Bounces up and down, just nibbles out a little bit of section here and there. Really great bit of kit. It's good for tidying up and everything. You can get in some really cool little shapes and everything with it. I want to play with it a little bit more. Um, that was my first time of using it and I didn't even practice, I got straight on it and I kind of got the, the gist of it all. The die grinder is fantastic, like until it kind of like skips and throws you. The only problem I hate about the die grinder is the um, the little shards that it, it really does create a, a proper mess. Like if you had a magnet to go over, you could pick up loads of these little splinters of, and they are nasty splinters, like of metal. So I like the die grinder it, and it is a really good bit of kit. I try not to use it that much because just the, how aggressive it is, if you kind of slip, you catch into the metal and the whole thing jerks, you could you know gouge yourself and it's the clear up of it as well. So with, with the electricals that's in there, it's, it's quite straightforward. So there's um, 240 volt, 13 amp coming in. So obviously the 13 amp at 240 volt kind of, 
really only allows me to use like 130 ounce on this welder, really without blowing or tripping a, a, a 13 amp fuse. So what comes off of that power supply, normally it goes straight into the welder or the transformer and there's a little spur that comes off that powers the fan. The guy fitted this fan in previously, um, I believe they put a fan in it and they call it turbo. It wasn't originally with, with the fan, but that wasn't a problem. That was quite easy to do. What I'd done, I put a nice little fuse box in there, like the one linked up on here. That allowed me, because I wanted a, um, a, a spur coming off. Now this was is going to be four, um, I can even put an extension lead on here. So rather than running two cables, I can then have that and it can, that can go onto like um, an angle grinder or a drill or whatever. But what I want to do is convert this to DC rather than AC as well. So I'm going to have an, hopefully have another little box that sits up on the top. That's going to need a little um, 240 volt fan in there as well. So that'll be then connected in, into that. So thinking about it as well, you're not actually be using your welder and also grinding at the same time. So if they're all on together at like 130 or even like 115, 120, and I was using the grind at the same time, which I'm not gonna be doing at the same time, then it would trip it, but that's not gonna be happening. It's either gonna be one or the other. So you can kind of safely run it off of that. As long as you're not working and buddying up with the buddy who's doing that whilst you're welding sort of thing. So the electricals come in. I've got a power switch to, I'll just turn it that way. So it comes into the power switch. The, the power switch is for, power switch just for the transform. This other switch here is for the auxiliary. Well, I call it the auxiliary, the spur coming off of it. Wee. So I've got about a good meat and a half on the tail, so I can plug that into like a household socket. HO7RN uh, cable, it smells lovely. It's really strong actually. That um, is probably overkill for this, but it's, it's quite a lot of protection there, just in case you was to accidentally hit it when you with a hot electrode. But when it, when it goes on, the fan automatically starts up. That's so like if it is hot, it can cool itself down, the transformer, even if you're not using it. Currently there's no power out on these electrodes here or they're out on the output. As soon as you hit that, there's a bit of a hum that then turns on the transformer. Um, and again, this 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 um, sort of spur can work independently. The fan's another good thing to have on it because it, it lets you know that it's, it's actually turned on. And this is a brand new fan and this sucks. Sucks quite a bit of air through the system. You can feel it sucking it all underneath and everything. What I had to do was replace the fan because that had um, actually one of the propellers uh, knocking off of it. But they're 240 volt fans, nice and powerful. Um, blows quite a lot of air out through here. You know, keep it all nice and cool. So yeah, it comes in, hits, goes in, 240 volt in goes into a, um, the fan's directly work, 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 like sort of connected to the, the power. So when it's plugged in, the fan's going. Then it comes off um, and then obviously goes to switch for the transformer. The same with the auxiliary, you can have that on or off as well. This is obviously exposed to the elements down here. There's obviously a live and a neutral. Um, hot glued them as well. And the channel wouldn't be the same if you didn't cover it in um, gaffer tape, duct tape. So wrapped a load of that around there. Originally around here, there was actually gonna be some bicycle inner tube tire sort of thing, but I couldn't really get it to stick very well. So that didn't really happen. And then this, this fan here, we've got a nice big printed 3D CEA and they're the electrical company, they're, they're the welding company, they're still going. Their sort of original color is yellow. That's why I kind of went with the yellow theme, but I've got a nice big sort of fan guard there. Nice big chunky one of their symbol logo on there. Originally this fan was going to be on the inside. 
foot at 140 volts or even 130, maybe 120, when the shunt's pushed all, all the way back, it would be hitting into the fan at the back there. So I kind of cut all the hole and everything, positioned it, and it wasn't until I started putting it together, you know, it was one of those moments where I was like, fuck. Um, so I made the decision to put it on the outside. When I put it on the outside, then obviously when you lift up the lid, you're, you're kind of like um, cutting into it like that sort of thing. So I just had to cut out a little panel there and had some of the pond liner that I used for the tray, tray liner for the, the tool cabinet. So I just put that on there with a few pop bits and the washer on there just to hold them in. Kind of helps to keep a bit of dust and water out. Not that we'd be in using much water around here anyway. Uh, obviously you never really want to weld in a wet puddle but sometimes it does happen. You get a bit of a drizzle, don't you, when you're welding and you carry on. Cut out logo here does the same. I originally was going to put that up here, had it all nicely marked out. These are still new, so they're quite nice and stiff. And then when I put the handle back on, I realised when you got this there, you, you couldn't turn your handle. It was a proper IFL free moment. And I was like, ah, what am I going to do? You know, I was going to contemplate about putting a socket, welding a socket sort of connector there and then having the handle there. I just thought that would be too much hassle you know, having to take the handle off and you could store it somewhere, but in the end I decided to make a blanking cap and then done the CEA logo on that as well. These these connectors here, there were switches here, one of them was originally, I believe one of them was originally with the welder and the second one won't. The rear one was checking the continuity of the welder, of, of the electrics in here. The positive and the negative, they were showing signs of continuity between them and you know, if you think about it, live should be live neutral should be neutral and there should not be any between your live and your neutral but because in here i've actually got the transformer welded in which is kind of pretty much dead short electrically it goes you know the the wire ones the round wind ones go around and they, they they connect to each other and i was kind of it puzzled me for a little while and um and i knew it was kind of right so i, I just double 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 checked it and created myself. I've got a couple of um, pictures of me just testing things with a broomstick just in case it wasn't right. So with, with the handle, it was quite battered around. You know, I had this actual case since I was probably about 17 and now I'm about 40. So I've had it a fair few years. This this thing here has got those little sort of scorch marks in there where I've had the, the MIG welder and, and, and the flux have come up on, on, on the wire and everything and create a little bowl. I've kind of knocked it off inside of there, try and set it loose from the copper nozzle. Um, but what I've noticed with a lot of plastics, depending on the type of plastic, you can sand it down and then go over it with a bit of a blowtorch. That then kind of brings it to a nice shiny, sort of sheeny sort of finish. So that's what I've done with this. Um, obviously the weight of this thing as well. I didn't really trust this little thing held in by this little screw here just to hold this whole weight. If that goes, then you know you've got this nice, it's not sharp, but you know, that will come down into your leg and, and, and give you a nice little gouge in your leg. So I just put on these little, little secure knocking bits here. That's just to give it a little bit more extra security on there. These machine labels, called it machine shop things, going back to the old and the new, obviously like we've got a nice old transformer here that I've kind of like restored We've got the new modern stuff, like your 16 amp plugs, your DINs, your neon switches. I wanted to kind of do a bit of a contrast. Now, originally the guy who'd done this video, I'll put a link at the top of it. I think they poured in like, um, you can get like a blacking paint. I think they call it blacking paint. And it's like an enamel, I think it's enamel on acrylic paint. But that would have looked a bit too, too new when I'd done the signs and I wanted to go for that older look. So, Looking around on the forums, one guy had, I think it was um, copper carbonate, copper calcium, one of those mixed with ammonia, and you put that on, and it just turns it like this black color after so long. You know, you've got to keep just disturbing it and painting it on, so to speak, and it, it kind of corrodes the brass on there, and then obviously you just then got a buff array that to then give you like your, your finish and, and let the actual, the detail and the letters actually stand out from the, the background. It's probably about like a, a mil, a, a, a mil depth there, maybe a bit less than a mil, maybe 0.75. 
But I wanted that contrast of old and new, and it's, it's quite hard to get new and old sort of to mix sometimes. But I kind of think I've kind of done it in a way. You know, I've got this nice handle. This, this to me, this this is goes with the transformer. You know, that that's that's just old. It, it feels old. You know, it's got that old feel about it. And I wanted to try and get some more of that back in onto the actual casing as well. So that's that's again with the, the you know your power thing. So you turn it that way to increase your power. Jesus Christ! You know what I've done? I've done it the wrong way around. <laughs> this way actually winds the power down. This way turns the power up. <laughs> Not to worry, I might leave this bit out of the video actually. Um, there's, yeah, there's another iPhone 3 mistake thing for you there. Um, but yeah, it gives it a little bit. Okay, so it's kind of the same one way or the other. Basically, it, it doesn't really matter. When, when you're welding, this is only gets you in the ballpark. Um, depending on the metal type thickness, the electrode type thickness, you know, um, the heat of the metal, you know, you get it roughly in the ballpark and then you adjust it as you go. You know, once the metal starts heating up, you might lay back a few amps and stuff. <laughs> but I've only just noticed that, funny enough. But I'm not gonna do anything about it because it's an original, it's an original mistake. So it's staying on. I fell free, over and out.